Hey physiology students, welcome to Monday's lecture, a continuation of chapter four, part one. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so if you remember last time, we did the introduction to neuron anatomy, neuroglial cells, and how neurons communicate with other cells. Okay, so now we're moving on to diving into neurotransmitter signaling. Now, this is the thing that is going to be important for nursing pharmacology. And it's going to seem like a lot of detail right now, but it does really apply to nursing. It applies to pharmacological drugs that patients receive for some of the most common problems. And so you can learn about uh, neurotransmitters by going to page 57 in the wiki textbook. But let's start with how neurons communicate their messages across a synapse to another cell. So, like I said in Friday's lecture, it depends on what kind of ion channel is open when a neurotransmitter crosses that synapse, binds to a receptor on that cell, it's gonna open up an ion channel. And depending on what ion channel is open, it tells you whether the cell is gonna be stimulated or it's gonna be relaxed and resting, okay? So here's what you need to remember. If the ion channel that opens up is a sodium, which is symbolized by Na, or a calcium symbolized by Ca channel, that is going to stimulate a cell. It causes an action potential. It causes depolarization. It causes excitation. Those all mean the same thing. All right, so the gift down here shows sodium flooding into a cell. And remember in chapter two, part two, I talked about cells are very careful about the charged ions that they allow into the cell because it really has a powerful impact on a cell. And sodium usually it's high concentration outside of the cell because a sodium, sodium makes it into a cell, it's going to cause that cell to become excited. So when I was talking about action potentials and I had the skier at the top of the jump and that skier was sodium and the little gate in front of the skier is similar to an ion channel, whether it's being opened or closed. And if you remember, when that gate opens, that sodium comes flooding down like a tsunami into the cell and it'll stimulate it. Um, calcium acts the same way. Okay, so sodium is always stimulatory. So sodium, S spelled with an S, is always stimulatory. Calcium, I remember calcium makes cells crazy. So those stimulate a cell when they're opened up. Now, if potassium ion channels are open or chloride ion channels are open, the opposite will happen. Okay, so in this GIF down here, you can see the potassium is leaving an ion channel, leaving the cell. I remember potassium, um, symbolized by K, makes cells kick back and relax. And I remember with chloride, with a C, keeps cells calm and cool, all right? So it all depends on what ion channel opens. Does it stimulate a cell or cause it to relax? Okay, so let's look at this GIF of an action potential coming down a synaptic knob of a neuron. And those little round things contain a neurotransmitter. Those are called vesicles, okay? So our first step is the action potential comes down this synaptic knob. And now look at those vesicles merging through exocytosis. The uh, neurotransmitter, the yellow balls here, are being released into the synapse. And now we're getting a close-up view of those pink things, our receptors on the postsynaptic cell. All right, and what's going to happen is those orange things are going to bind to a receptor, and it's opening up an ion channel, and the ion is flooding into the cell. And as it comes in, it'll show you, oh, it's sodium. That's stimulatory. So this postsynaptic cell, see this orange light that lights up? That's an action potential that has started, all right? So that's excitatory. That's sodium makes cells stimulated, all right? Okay, so when you're looking at the PDF version of this PowerPoint online, you can click here for a really good YouTube video that tells you about how a, neuron, a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor, and depending on what ion channel it opens up, it tells you whether it's being stimulated or it's being relaxed, all right? I'll let you look at that on your own. Okay, so recap, all in one little screen here. In general, if a neurotransmitter binds to receptor on a muscle cell or gland and it opens up sodium uh, channels or uh, calcium channels, remember sodium makes cells stimulated and calcium makes cells crazy, they're gonna be stimulated. 
All right, we're going to have a little test. We're going to have a little embedded test in this PowerPoint shortly. I'm going to test you. Okay, and if a potassium or a chloride ion channel, chloride ion channel opens up, remember potassium is symbolized by the letter K, and I think it makes cells kick back and relax, and chloride helps cells stay cool and calm. They're going to be inhibited or relaxed. All right, so all you need to know is which ion channel is it, and then you can tell exactly how the cell is going to respond. Okay, so here's what can happen when a cell is stimulated. There's different ways a cell can be stimulated, and we do know that the ions sodium and calcium stimulate a cell, but it can do it in different ways. So let's look at what can happen. When a cell is stimulated, that is called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, and that is a mouthful, so just call it by the acronym EPSP. Okay, so that means stimulation. Now, these types of stimulations can um, occur with by what's called a graded potential. Now, don't worry about the screen right now. Just look at me. You're graded in this course, in any course. You're graded based on the uh, effort that you put into the course. If you put in a lot of effort and dedication, you work hard, the more you work, the higher your grade or the more response you get, the better grade response you get. If you don't put much effort into it, you're going to get a lesser grade or a lesser response. Our cells work the same way, but with neurotransmitters. So the more neurotransmitter that is released into a synapse, the more it binds with receptors, you get a huge cell response in terms of stimulation. They get really stimulated. If there's only a little bit of neurotransmitter released, then you get a lesser cell response. Let me give you an applied version of this that we covered in chapter one, believe it or not. Okay, remember positive feedback. When um, there's either a woman is uh, breastfeeding a child or a woman is going through childbirth, what was that hormone that is released um, by the hypothalamus when either a child stimulates the nipple for breastfeeding or a baby's head presses on the cervix during childbirth? What did the hypothalamus release? If you said oxytocin, you're right, okay? Oxytocin causes the milk let down on the breast and it causes the uterine contractions during childbirth. Now, wanna know what a graded response is? When a woman is breastfeeding her child, a little bit of oxytocin, that's a chemical messenger, a little bit of oxytocin is released, enough to allow milk let down. When a woman is breastfeeding her child, that little bit of oxytocin will cause mild uterine contractions. And I mentioned that in that chapter that breastfeeding is good for the uterus to get back to normal shape, but it's just a little bit of oxytocin. So you only get a little bit of uterine contractions, a little cell response. In childbirth, the amount of oxytocin that is released is gargantuan, all right? The body is flooded with it and you get a huge response by uterine contractions. That is a graded response. A little bit of neurotransmitter, little response. A lot of neurotransmitter, huge response. Okay, that's one way that neurotransmitters affect how, how a cell responds. Okay, the next thing that can happen is the stimulation can, you can have summation. Now this is not about the amount of neurotransmitter released. This is about the frequency at which that cell is being stimulated. Okay, so if you have infrequent stimulation of the cell, let's say this is a stimulus. Okay, stimulus, stimulus stimulus. That's infrequent. And so you're going to get a lesser cell response. But if you hammer a cell with stimulation, stimulation, stimulate, stim, 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 that cell is going to go crazy. So it's not the amount of neurotransmitter, it's the frequency of the stimulation. That's called summation. Okay. All right. Now, here's an example of causing an excitation or stimulation of a cell. And you know that when you are in a fight flight situation, right? What happens to your heart? It starts pounding, right? Pound, 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 pound. Blood's whooshing through your ears. That's excitation. Your heart rate goes up. Okay. What is the hormone in your blood? That's part of your fight flight. You probably know it as adrenaline, right? Adrenaline. Adrenaline is epinephrine. That is acting like a neurotransmitter to your heart that hormone is going to bind to receptors on your heart. It's going to open up an ion channel, okay? And it's going to stimulate the heart. So now we're getting to, oh, you learned how heart rate goes up and down. You learned about heart anatomy. Here's how it's actually going up, the heart rate. Epinephrine, known as adrenaline, 
will bind to a special receptor for adrenaline on the heart called an adrenergic. The word adren is in it for adrenaline. And it's a beta one. We'll learn about that later in the, in the chapter. But it binds to that receptor. If you see that sodium and calcium ion channels are opened up, you know the heart's going to be stimulated, okay? Because sodium makes cells stimulated and calcium makes cells crazy, okay? So knowing the ion channel predicts what that cell is going to do. Now, we looked at stimulation or an EPSP with sodium or calcium. Let's look at the opposite. What happens when a cell is inhibited, okay? An inhibitory postsynaptic potential, just use the acronym IPSP. When it neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, you're going to have potassium, symbolized by K, or chloride ion channels here that are going to open up. And those ions leave the cell, and that causes the cell to relax, causes it to rest. It causes repolarization, which means rest. There's lots of words for the same thing, but think rest. Okay, so if those ion channels open, you know what the cell is going to do. It's not going to do anything. It's going to rest. Now, here's an example in the heart again. So when you're calm and at rest in the rest and digest or parasympathetic nervous system, you're calm. So your heart rate's going to be low because you're not in fight flight. Here's what slows your heart rate down. The neurotransmitter slash hormone is called acetylcholine. We'll learn more about that in the next lecture. But all you need to know is when that hormone, the neurotransmitter, binds to its receptor on the heart muscle cells, all you need to see is, oh, potassium channels are open. I know potassium makes cells kick back and relax. That cell is going to relax. Okay? So all you need to know for this lecture, the focus is you can stimulate a cell if sodium or calcium channels are open, or you can relax a cell if potassium or chloride ion channels are opened up. That's all you need to know for right now. We'll bring it all together in future lectures. Don't worry about that today. Okay, so we're gonna introduce you to two types of receptors. And if you remember on Friday's lecture, I showed you the students' emails that said, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you went over this because in nursing pharmacology, I had to know all this stuff. So if you learn this now, when you get to the nursing program in pharmacology, you're not gonna have to relearn it. It's gonna be review for you. Okay, so when a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor, there's two types of receptors. I'm gonna make it real simple for you. The first kind is a nicotinic receptor. Okay, all you need to know is nicotinic receptors are found primarily on your skeletal muscles, all right? They're found some other places in the body, but all you need to know is they're found on your skeletal muscles. Your skeletal muscles, you have voluntary control of. So these receptors are for voluntary control of your muscles. Now, we'll get to the neurotransmitter and everything shortly, but here's what I want you to remember. How to remember a nicotinic receptor is for voluntary control of skeletal muscles. Okay, so think of this. If you smoke, I hope you don't, or vape, whatever. We still don't know the health concerns about that, but it's starting to come out. Um, what you need to do is think of nicotine, all right? And if you want to pick up a cigarette or a vape, you use voluntary muscle movement to pick that up and put it to your mouth to smoke it. So think nicotinic, nicotine is for voluntary movement because you have to voluntarily pick that up to smoke it, all right? So think nicotinic. Nicotine, I have to pick up that cigarette or vapor to smoke it. And so that will, rem you'll remember that, okay? That's one type of receptor and that's for skeletal muscles. The other type of receptor is for things you don't have voluntary control of. So think about what you don't have voluntary control of. Can you control the depolarization of your heart? Not really. Um, can you control your glands? Yeah, make your parotid glands, your salivary glands, squirt right now. Open your mouth and say, go. You can't do it, can you? You can't do any of those things voluntarily. What about the smooth muscle in your arteries? Can you make your arteries constrict or dilate? Can you make the food and liquid move through the GI tract with smooth muscle? You don't have any control over those things. So, muscarinic receptors are for all things that are autonomic. So when you think of muscarinic, I want you to think you must. You have no choice. You have no control. It's autonomic, autopilot, okay? Muscarinic receptors are for things you don't have control over. That means heart muscle, smooth muscle, and your glands. 
you can't control either of those, all right? So those are the two types of receptors, one for voluntary muscle movement and two muscarinic receptors for things you can't control. All right, and then we'll talk about removal systems for neurotransmitters next. Okay, so nicotinic receptors on your skeletal muscle for voluntary movement. Here's how your skeletal muscles work. Okay, in anatomy, you learned, oh, the musculocutaneous nerve controls the biceps brachialis muscle that when it stimulates it, it causes that muscle to contract, which bends your elbow. Good job for anatomy, right? Well, here's physiology. The physiology is the musculocutaneous nerve found right here in the arm on the anterior surface is a motor nerve. It's going to release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. That's what the ACH stands for, acetylcholine. All your skeletal muscles are stimulated by acetylcholine. When acetylcholine released from the musculocutaneous nerve binds to receptors on your biceps brachialis muscle, all right, it's going to be a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. It's nicotinic, remember that's for voluntary movement, you pick up the cigarette to smoke it, and it's called a cholinergic receptor is because it's working with acetylcholine, go back here, it's working with acetylcholine, choline's in the name of the neurotransmitter, choline will be in the name of the receptor. Okay, and the ion channel that is opened up when that neurotransmitter binds is sodium. Sodium makes cells stimulated. So now you know physiology of how muscles are stimulated. It's motor nerve releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors on those muscle cells. It opens up sodium every single time and it stimulates that muscle to contract. All right, so that's the physiology of how your muscles work. Now, that's a nicotinic receptor. Let's look at a muscarinic receptor for the same neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Remember, muscarinic receptors, you must. You have no choice. It's for things you can't control, for heart muscle, smooth muscles, and glands. Okay, now the neurotransmitter binds to a muscarinic receptor on those muscle cells or gland cells. Since it's a receptor for acetylcholine, it's called the whole name muscarinic because you must. You have no control over it and cholinergic because it's for acetylcholine. So that's a long word, all right? Okay, so there are acetylcholine receptors that are muscarinic. They're called muscarinic cholinergic receptors. And we will talk about other receptors later on for epinephrine or adrenaline, but we're not there yet. But remember, if it's muscarinic, all you need to know is you have no control over those muscle cells or glands. Okay, if that acetylcholine or neurotransmitter, any neurotransmitter, binds to its muscarinic receptor on a muscle cell or gland and it opens up sodium and or calcium, it's going to stimulate the cell. If it's a muscle cell, it'll contract. If it's a gland, it'll squirt out whatever it's made to secrete. If that receptor opens up uh, an ion channel for potassium or chloride, remember it keeps cells uh, cool and calm or it kicks them back and relax. So you know the cells are going to relax, muscle cells relax, gland cells stop secreting. Okay, just know the ion channels and what it does to a cell. Here's the test. Okay, you don't even know this image. You've probably never seen it before. All you need to know is here's what's happening. We've got a postsynaptic cell membrane here. Here is a receptor embedded in the membrane and here is where the neurotransmitter binds and it's telling you it's acetylcholine that's binding, so it must be a cholinergic receptor. I don't know if it's a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. Oh, it says nicotinic, so we know this is going to a skeletal muscle. Okay, look at the ion channel that's open and look what's entering the cell, sodium. The question I pose to you, is this neurotransmitter acetylcholine and its receptor going to have an EPSP stimulation or an IPSP relaxation response on that muscle cell. Will it stimulate it to contract or will it cause it to relax? Sodium makes cells stimulated. So the answer is this is going to stimulate the muscle to contract. Okay, it's sodium. Next test. 
Okay, this one's a little busier. This is a muscarinic receptor, which means it's going to be to a cardiac muscle or a smooth muscle or a gland cell. You have no control over those. So it's a muscarinic, you must respond. Okay, and it says it's a muscarinic adrenergic. It's the word for adrenaline. That's your fight flight hormone. That's going to be epinephrine. Okay, so here we have norepinephrine, which is similar to epinephrine, binding to its receptor. Ignore all the stuff in the middle. Don't worry about that. Look at the ion channel and the ion that's entering the cell. Sodium. So is it going to produce an EPSP or an IPSP? The answer is EPSP. It's going to stimulate. Sodium is always stimulatory, okay? For all we know, this could be a heart muscle cell and, um, well, it wouldn't be with norepinephrine, but it doesn't matter what kind of cell, you know it's going to be stimulated. Let's go to the next test and last one. Okay, this is a neurotransmitter I haven't even introduced to you yet. It's called GABA, all right? It's an acronym for a much longer word. But anyway, GABA is binding to a receptor here on the cell membrane. And look, oh, chloride ion channels are opened up. Oh, okay. I don't even know what this is binding to. I don't know what kind of cell it is, all right? But all I know is chloride ion channels are opened up. What does chloride ion channels do when they're opened up in a cell? It keeps cells calm and cool. So you know it's going to be an IPSP or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. It's going to cause that cell, whatever it is, to relax. If it's a muscle cell, it's going to relax. If it's a gland cell, it's not going to secrete anything. So that's your first test in physiology, at least in lecture test. All right. All right. We are almost to the end. I know this is a lot compared to the first lecture on Friday, but let's look at acetylcholine and its receptors. The word acetylcholine, let's look it up top here. Acetylcholine, all right? It ends in choline. All its receptors, all acetylcholine receptors are gonna be called cholinergic, okay? But there's two types of receptors. There's the nicotinic kind, which is for voluntary muscle movement, and then there is the muscarinic kind for autonomic or involuntary movement, all right? But it's still called cholinergic, but the word in front of it could mean for voluntary control, nicotinic, or for involuntary control, muscarinic. Okay, so let's look at the first example. It's repeat of what we've already covered. Somatic motor neurons. Motor neurons delivering a command to your skeletal muscles, which you have control over, all right? So that acetylcholine is gonna to bind to nicotinic cholinergic receptors on those muscles. This was the biceps brachii uh, muscle example. The receptor is called cholinergic. Look, the word choline is right there for acetylcholine, okay? But it's the nicotinic receptor. Remember, nicotinic, think nicotine, think cigarette, which you have to voluntarily pick up to smoke, okay? And it will stimulate the muscle cells to contract. It's going to be an EPSP or stimulation. Okay, and that's all you need to know at all about nicotinic cholinergic receptors. Next, involuntary responses. Smooth muscles and glands. Okay, so involuntary motor neuron, autonomic motor neurons. They say here parasympathetic. You're gonna learn soon. Parasympathetic is part of your rest and digest. This is when everything's cool and calm and your life is not in danger. So acetylcholine released from these motor neurons binds to if it's smooth muscles or glands, you don't have control over those, they're gonna be called muscarinic because you must, you have no choice, it's autonomic, muscarinic cholinergic. Now, it could stimulate some things and inhibit other things. Okay, so smooth muscle. Acetylcholine binding to muscarinic cholinergic receptors on your GI tract smooth muscle. That's moving material through your digestive system. Acetylcholine is going to speed that stuff up, okay? Um, if it's acetylcholine binding to smooth muscle of your bronchioles, it's actually going to cause them to contract a little, all right? That'll actually be a bit of a stimulation. If it's, oh, the next one. If it's acetylcholine going to your heart, which is the next example, your heart, cardiac muscles you have no control over, it's going to slow the heart rate down. It's going to open up potassium channels, which are going to cause your heart rate to go down, the muscle cells start relaxing, okay? So muscarinic cholinergic, the muscarinic means you must, you have no control of it, so I want you to think smooth muscle, heart muscle, and glands. 
and cholinergic means it's for acetylcholine, okay? The receptor name is always going to match the name of the hormone or neurotransmitter, always, well, most of the time, not always. Okay, more review of what we just looked at in a table format. This is just repetition. So on the left, acetylcholine binding with nicotine at cholinergic receptors. You should automatically, you automatically think nicotine, nicotine, nicotine. Oh, cigarette. You have to pick a cigarette to smoke it, which means you need voluntary muscle movement. What happens is acetylcholine binds to a nicotine at cholinergic receptor on the skeletal muscle cell. It's going to open up sodium ion channels, which are always stimulatory, and you get muscle excitation or muscle contraction. All your skeletal muscles work this way. Okay, on the other side, the right side, acetylcholine in muscarinic receptors, meaning you must, it's autonomic, you have no choice, and acetylcholine binds to cholinergic receptors. So if this is heart muscles that are responding, acetylcholine binds to a muscarinic cholinergic receptor on the heart. And look, ooh, potassium ion channels are opened up, potassium leaves, and that means the heart rate goes down, the heart rests. Okay, what happens when acetylcholine binds to mm, other uh, muscarinic cholinergic receptors? Okay, GI tract activity. When acetylcholine binds to its muscarinic cholinergic receptor on your GI tract smooth muscle, oh look, both sodium and calcium channels are open. Wow, both the stimulatory neurotransmitters. So you get excitation. What that does is it causes contraction in the smooth muscle, which pushes food and liquid through your GI tract, all right? So in your heart, acetylcholine slows things down, but in your GI tract, acetylcholine speeds things up. So we have two opposing things that can happen. All right, neurotransmitter removal systems. Okay, I know this is the heavy hitters here. This is where we get into some importance of nursing pharmacology because these removal systems are how you normally get the neurotransmitter out of the synapse. Once the neurotransmitter has balanced to its receptor, opened up its ion channel, done its job to stimulate a cell or cause it to rest, you need to get that neurotransmitter out of the uh, synapse because if it's not, it's going to keep either stimulating a cell or inhibiting it. And so we have removal systems to tightly control neurotransmitters because they have such profound impacts on cells. So here's some removal systems. Diffusion. Once the neurotransmitter hits the synapse, binds to its receptor, has its effect, that neurotransmitter diffuses back into the neuron that secreted it. It just gets sucked back in. That's not a very common method of removal. Here is a common method of removal, enzyme breakdown of a neurotransmitter. Um, so in the synapse, an enzyme breaks that neurotransmitter down into its component parts, like acetylcholine will get broken into uh, acetate and choline. And acetate and choline can't bind to a, a receptor. They can't stimulate anymore. And then the neuron sucks back up those chemicals and stitches them back together into a neurotransmitter in the vesicles. Okay, so here's an example. Acetylcholine esterase, uh, ACH-E, the E stands for esterase. It ends in ASC, so you know it's an enzyme. This is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine in the synapse. It's very important because if you don't break down acetylcholine, let's say we're talking about acetylcholine in the synapse with skeletal muscles. We know acetylcholine opens up sodium channels with skeletal muscle cells and makes them contract. If you don't get acetylcholine out of the synapse, the muscle develops tetany. It can't relax. So you have to get the acetylcholine out, okay? We'll talk about why that's important later on, some real clinical relevant examples. Another common enzyme breakdown system is called monoamine oxidase, okay? Oxidase ends in ASE, it's the enzyme. And the monoamine stands for what neurotransmitters it breaks down. It's the enzyme that breaks down monoamine neurotransmitters in the synapse. And those include neurotransmitters called dopamine. You've probably heard of that. Serotonin, you've probably heard of that. And epinephrine, I'm sure you've heard of that. So we're going to talk about, a, I'm going to have you look at it, a YouTube video removal of acetylcholine from the synapse with acetylcholinesterase. Very important. Okay, let's move on to another removal system. This one's not going to be very common. Glial cell removal. In your blood-brain barrier, 
there are some neurotransmitters that are removed by astrocytes that make up your blood brain barrier. But it's a very, I can think of one neurotransmitter I cover in this um, chapter. I'll mention it later, but it's not very common. The last removal system is reuptake, and that is important, as important as enzyme breakdown. What happens with reuptake is the neuron that secreted the neurotransmitter reuptakes the neurotransmitter from the synapse and removes it that way. Now here's a good example. Prozac, Lexapro, Citalopram are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. What that means is, I've got the acronym and the letters. It's selective, meaning it's focusing on serotonin. And what it does is it inhibits the reuptake of serotonin. If you inhibit the reuptake of serotonin from the synapse, that means you leave more serotonin in the synapse, which can have more of an effect on the cell. Okay, so these drugs, if you know anything about them, they're the most commonly prescribed drugs for depression. And depression is associated with low serotonin, all right? In fact, of all of our body, only 10% of the serotonin receptors are located in your brain and your spinal cord. About 90% of them are found in your GI tract. So you only have a set number of serotonin receptors in your brain anyway. And if you have low serotonin coupled with low numbers of receptors, you have profound effects cognitively and depression and anxiety um, and panic attacks and all kinds of disorders um, are associated with low serotonin. So if you want to treat someone with low serotonin, you want to make more serotonin available in the synapse with cells. So what you can do is give a drug like an SSRI. It will prevent reuptake of serotonin, leaving more serotonin in the synapse so you get more of an effect from it. And that is what relieves the symptoms of depression and anxiety. You're elevating serotonin levels. Welcome to where physiology meets nursing pharmacology. Depression, one of the most commonly diagnosed problems that we know of in, in, in the world, well, certainly in the United States, and these are some of the most commonly prescribed drugs. And if you go to page 65 and 75 of your wiki textbook, you can read more about that and pay special attention to my comments on those pages. Okay, so here's why neurotransmitter signaling, ion channels, and the removal of neurotransmitters are so vital for human health. Now, here's a diagram showing how acetylcholinesterase removes acetylcholine from the synapse. Okay, here we have the um, neuron that releases the acetylcholine. Here we go. All right, here's acetylcholine. The big white space is the synapse, and on the postsynaptic cell is the receptor. Now, I don't know if this is, it says this is between a somatic motor neuron and skeletal muscle. So this must be a nicotinic cholinergic receptor for acetylcholine, and that will open up sodium channels and stimulate the muscle cells. Now, unless you want your muscle cells to keep contracting, keep contracting, keep contracting, you need acetylcholinesterase to grab that acetylcholine and break it down into its components of acetate and choline so it stops stimulating the muscle cells. All right, we're gonna talk about in the next chapter, Wednesday, we'll be on campus by then, I'll tell you the story of an animal, because I'm a veterinary technician, and I'm a licensed veterinary technician, which is a licensed uh, nurse for animals, when I saw a dog come in with cholinergic syndrome that has to do with this enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, being inactivated. All right? All right, but I won't steal my thunder. We'll talk about that soon. Okay, so when you're looking at the PDF of this PowerPoint online, um, you can look at the YouTube video of acetylcholine released into the synapse, and then being broken down by acetylcholinesterase. So I'm gonna see, so this is the last slide of the PowerPoint. So let's go ahead and look at that. And this will be the end of this uh, Monday's lecture. It was a little bit longer than Friday's lecture, but here we go. Let's make this nice and big. Okay. So here we have the action potential coming from the presynaptic neuron. You can see the little vesicles that are gonna open up and release the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. And I've got this sped up, believe it or not. Okay, so here we, the, the vesicles are going to merge and release acetylcholine. All right, I had a little GIF in the PowerPoint for this. It's going to zoom in here to the receptor where the acetylcholine is going to bind to that receptor. And it's going to get there, trust me. Okay, we are docking. 
Now, it opens up the ion channel, and we're going to see that little purple balls are going to be sodium ions, which you know to be stimulatory. So that cell is going to get stimulated. It's going to form an action potential right here, an EPSP. Okay, now that the cell is stimulated, you've got to get rid of that acetylcholine, or the cell is just going to be stimulated, stimulated, stimulated. The blue things are acetylcholinesterase that break up the neurotransmitter in it to its component chemical parts, and that will get sucked back up into the neuron, stitched together into acetylcholine back into the vesicles. But that cell is done being stimulated, and that's very important. If you mess with those enzymes in that removal system, you're going to have serious problems. Okay? All right. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So you made it through Monday's lecture. It's a big one, okay? But I haven't gotten to the hardest hitting stuff yet. That will be on Wednesday, but we'll be in person. But what we have gone over is the neurotransmitter is released at the synapse, binds to a receptor, and depending on the ion channel that opens up, if it's sodium, calcium, stimulate. If it's potassium or chloride, keeps the cells calm. We know that when cells are stimulated, it can be based on how much neurotransmitter is released, a lot or a little, like oxytocin, and that cell will respond accordingly, or the frequency at which a cell is stimulated. And then we talked about nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. Nicotinic is for voluntary skeletal muscles. Muscarinic is for heart muscles, smooth muscles, and glands. And then we talked about enzyme removal systems with an introduction for why these enzyme removal systems are important. And on Wednesday, I'll give you an example of when those removal systems are messed up. Okay, so this is the end of Monday's lecture. So I'm going to stop the share. And if you have any questions, make sure and email me. Um, other than that, I will see you on Wednesday. I can't wait to meet you. It's going to be awesome. All right.